Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, how the wellness and mental health efforts of tribal communities position them to come out of the pandemic. We understand and know that you know mental health, behavioral health, it's holistic but also intergenerational. Plus, a deep funding cut for an educational program in the Bosque that does double duty when it comes to science. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. We're talking about the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, an effort that brings students to the Rio Grande, but also has delivered important data. Laura Pascas digs in a little later. Our line opinion panel has assembled this week to talk about the stunning overpayment of unemployment benefits as the state struggled to respond during the pandemic. They'll also talk about a new study that says New Mexico and its taxpayers could be on the hook for billions of dollars in cleanup costs when and if the oil and gas industry goes bust. We begin with a space shot that's been a very long time in coming. New Mexico is officially no longer just the land of enchantment. Last weekend, we became only the third state to successfully send humans into space as Virgin Galactic successfully launched the VMS Unity into suborbit. Now, in many ways, it was the culmination of more than a decade of efforts to put our state on the interstellar map. It's also cost more than 200 million in taxpayer dollars. Got to get that in. The question remains, will that investment pay off in the long run? Here to help us debate that question is this week's line Zoom panel. We welcome back Tom Garrity of the Garrity Group. And also with us this week is Diane Snyder, a former state senator, and Serge Martinez of the UNM Law School. Welcome to you all. Now, guys, New Mexico's partnership with Virgin Galactic started with a handshake between Sir Richard Branson and former Governor Bill Richardson. It now includes a spaceport, Virgin Galactic's home base, of course, and more than 100 companies that support this industry. My question to you, starting with Tom, is this. Does this weekend's successful launch validate Governor Richardson's decision, and does it quiet the critics? Uh, yes, and yes, and no, and no. Uh, you know, it all it <laughs> nice. all depends which which uh, side of the apple you want to bite from. Um, you know, I think that uh, the victory lap for Governor, former Governor Richardson mm -hmm. and Sir Richard Branson, is well deserved. They were on site. Uh, I should, we should mention uh, for the launch, they were both there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that, you know, they, they definitely deserve that victory lap. There have definitely been a lot of issues, you know, the runway being replaced, uh, not just once, but twice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some administrative issues. Uh, but all of that has been cleaned up. And I think that is headed in the right direction. It is a lot of money. But as we can see with, uh, you know, with uh, Amazon and as well as with um, uh, Tesla, all, you know, having their own kind of perspectives as well. It was an investment that I think positioned New Mexico well mm -hmm. uh, in, in this particular space. Mm -hmm. Senator, I got to ask you the same question. You've been tracking this, of course, for a long time from your elected days till now. Is, is Governor Richardson validated here? Are we on the right track finally? Uh, yes, yes. I'm kind of like Tom, yes and no. Okay. It was, I happened to be in the Senate mm -hmm. when we voted for this, I believe 15 years ago. and. I was one of the few, very few, Tom might be able to remember exactly, but one of the very, very few Republicans who voted for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was Richardson's folly. It was all these right. horrible, horrible things being said. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see the vision that Mr. Branson had. I, you look at New Mexico and you think of our history and what we've done and, and it's, you know, the nuclear bomb is not space, but we've done so many innovative things here. Mm -hmm. And we've got this wide open land out there to have a spaceport. To me, it was a natural thing. And I I talked about on the floor that day, talked about Sally Ride and Chris McAuliffe. I could, you know, many of us were never trained to be a, a, a an astronaut, but there are so many people in New Mexico, I know some that that can see themselves in that history and being a part of it. Mm -hmm. And little girls I see longing to be in space. Well, if they maybe they're going to be entrepreneurs instead and develop their money and pay their two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to fly. But it's it's 
something that's unique to us. Yes, we're just the third state, mm -hmm. but I see us becoming the leader in it in, in commercial space flight. Mm -hmm. And I think I've read someplace that Mr. Branson thinks, now he may have just been saying that to Governor Richardson, but <laughs> I think he sees that because of the things I've mentioned, the wide open spaces, right. the entrepreneurial belief in, in attitudes we have in New Mexico, as well as, of course, our, our labs. I think New Mexico could easily expand our role of being leading scientists and leading the country, maybe even the universe, because like going into space. That's you right. Know? I like it. I like, we, I like your worldview. That's right. Your yeah, universe. We can, we can become that leader. We can be the, at the top of the list. I, I think you're quite right there. Hey, Serge, you know, Virgin's expected to launch two more flights this summer. But I gotta, I gotta imagine that until there is a paying customer, Senator just mentioned the, the quarter million dollars, by the way, for the privilege, um, that the big turning point is when, first, when paying customers get into space. Would you, would you agree with that, that this is all noise until that happens? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It is super, super cool and mm -hmm. exciting. And, you know, I would love to be on that spaceship as well. Um, would you? And I'll be the first in line for the New yeah. Mexico and Focus <laughs> Charter. You're going to be second behind Senator Snyder, actually. Yeah, You're not going to be first. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think, yeah, we are a long way from this being, you know, from the, the victory lap is a little bit premature, I think. Uh, no, it's certainly, it's there's a <laughs> lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> excited, but yeah, I don't know that there's going to be an endless stream of people, you know, willing to pay, uh, willing and able to pay all that money. I hope so. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. I would. I mean, the idea it, sounds fantastic, and we're but well. There, there are already a, a long list of people signed up to be on it, and not just the leaders and volunteers. It's actually people who have put their deposits down to go uh, on this shot, uh, this ride. And I'm right. just. Tom, is there is there a time when regular New Mexicans might be able to afford something like this? Is, is that possible? You know, I, I guess that's really up to uh, you know Virgin Galactic. But you know, I think that uh, you know the pricing right now is you know there's what's the pricing that's being proposed, or at least that what people are paying, and then there's the pricing. You know, uh, once everything is up and running, mm -hmm. you know, when when you look at Jeff Bezos's operation. Uh, and their proposed prices, I mean, 250000 250000 is a bargain compared to the other prices to go mm -hmm. up into suborbital, uh, you know, suborbit and such. So, you know, I, I, hopefully New Mexicans will have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, having been raised, uh, you know, in a time with, of the Apollo space program uh, and, yeah. and watching, you know, Neil Armstrong take that first step on the moon, um, you know, who would have ever thought mm -hmm. that uh, this is something that's even possible? And now New Mexico is one of three states uh, to have successfully launched a human into space. I think that's a, it's a great time for a victory lap, Serge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Me too. Senator, you know, there's, there's 170 employees on the ground already. You know, it's not as if this is, this is like a pipe dream anymore. There are people here, they are, they're paying taxes, they're paying, you know, groceries and everything else and buying cars. Is that, is that a sign to you that this thing's really moving forward? Well, yes, when you consider that it started just 15 years ago mm -hmm. from a blank desert field. I mean, there was nothing there. There were no stores, no restaurants, no people, no no ter uh, terminal. You call it a terminal when they come out. Sure. Uh, okay. I mean, nothing was there. That's right. There have been some of the space competitions. I believe there are uh, high school kids have mm -hmm. done some space things mm -hmm. at the spaceport. It's we're bringing. We talk a lot about uh, bringing our kids into Mesa, the science, math, science, and things. This is an opportunity for them to develop um, a prototype into going into space and being educated in the thought process that it is possible. And I'm serious when you think in terms of 170 jobs when it started just 15 years ago sure. as a blank desert field. That's a good point. I think we've come a long way, and I think there's, I think, pun intended, the sky is the limit. I love you it. Know, we, I love it. Hey, Serge, I, I got to bring this up, though. There's been a lot of concerns over the years about transparency uh, with these folks. When you really think about it, uh, the, the spaceport I'm talking about, um, the contracts largely hidden from public view because of proprietary concerns, despite the fact that taxpayers financed the spaceport's construction. 
in that in some cases. This is information disclosed publicly elsewhere. Is that piece of the, it going to come back to haunt us here? What, what's your sense of the, of the transparency issue and how they approach it? Uh, well, Gene, I have to confess, I'm not super, super familiar with this uh, particular history. Nothing wrong, know, nothing wrong with that. But, you know, generally transparency is, you know, I'm, I think it's an unalloyed good and anything that ends up being lack, right. you know, with the lack of transparency, there's potential for problems. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there's necessarily anything shady, but, it, you know, that's a recipe for disaster when you have lots of money and, and not a lot of uh, people being able to see what's going on. Yeah. Never a good thing. Well, that's a good point. Tom, real quick, one last question. You know, leadership questions down there too. Don't forget, they fired executive director Dan Hicks, who had been there for quite a long time, since the beginning, I, I believe. Does that give you any pause at all? Is there a leadership vacuum void at the top, or are you feeling like we're in good shape here? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the state of New Mexico has really kind of, they identified what the issues were. Uh, they made the changes that were necessary, and mm -hmm. I think that from what I've seen, that they are in, it definitely headed in the right direction. You know, it's important to remember that Virgin Galactic and Spaceport America are just one part of the aerospace and directed energy picture in the state. You know, there are more than 60 different uh, solid firms like Boeing, mm -hmm. uh, also support by Air Force Research Laboratory, mm -hmm. Sandia Labs. Uh, and so, you know, New Mexico is very well positioned here. And, uh, you know, the Spaceport, obviously right now, the focal point of all of those efforts. Good point there. That'll do it for now on this topic. But when we come back, we'll dive into new revelations about unemployment overpayments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Be sure, to, be sure to share your thoughts on this weekend's historic launch we just talked about at Spaceport America on our Facebook page and sign up to be part of our Focus on New Mexico group. The sky is not falling if we have to set some data sets aside for a year um, yet. We're actually approaching closer to 25 years of, of data with a lot of these data sets. And the, the continuity is one of the things that makes these data sets so special. The pandemic partners of isolation, stress, and COVID-19 fatigue can have an impact on mental well-being. If we're honest with ourselves, many of us have felt it over the past year plus. And May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and experts are encouraging the public to reflect on their own mental health, engage in self-care, and check in on others. That's really important. That's true for all of us and for tribal communities that face some culturally unique challenges. That hasn't gone unnoticed at the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department during the pandemic, and the state agency has partnered with a suicide prevention group. Here's correspondent Antonia Gonzalez with more. Eldred, Alicia, and Teresa, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for having us. And Teresa, Honoring Native Life and Indian Affairs has been hosting virtual trainings. What are some of the things that you've been hearing about mental health and tribal communities during the pandemic? We've, we've actually been hearing a lot and, and, and really appreciative of the uh, collaboration with New Mexico Indian Affairs. We know that the uh, pandemic has disproportionately affected um, American Indians and our tribal nations. And so we've been working very closely to ensure that we're um, doing the training that's necessary and uh, putting out messaging to help um, our com tribal communities through this uh, pandemic. But we're, we do see, hear about a lot of um, increased anxiety, increased depression, um, some um, spikes in, in uh, suicide rates um, that, we're, that, we're, that we're hearing about. So we're trying to address many of those issues. Um, and Eldred, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think just all of us, you know, from a personal standpoint to a professional standpoint, we feel, you know, this, this, um, this absence of community, this absence of really coming together as, as tribal peoples. And I think that really has kept a lot of us in isolation, has led to increases in what Teresa just mentioned, uh, a lot of those mental health challenges. And really from tribal perspective, tribal leadership to tribal youth, We've been hearing this, um, the need for more behavioral and mental health resources and services on and off um, tribal reservations. And so the Indian Affairs Department is just so happy to collaborate with not only Honor Native Life, but also our newly established Indigenous Youth Council. And what are some of those challenges? Can you expand on that a little bit? We know in rural areas, um, 
there's lack of internet service. There's also access to, or lack of access to healthcare. Um, there's even a lot of um, different issues when it comes to addressing mental health itself. So what are some of those challenges? Yes, so the, one of the major challenges was, of course, the limited access to broadband uh, capabilities. So when the world was closing down, when New Mexico was closing, uh, a lot of our tribal communities, you know, everything was moving towards telehealth. And a lot of our tribal communities, some of the most rural, did not have those capacities, uh, capabilities, even to, to, to today. Um, there's been a lot of progress, definitely, from the state of New Mexico to help that. But that's really what happened. And even prior to the pandemic itself, uh, tribal communities had a very limited amount of behavioral health providers, whether that be counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, et cetera. And so really um, what the Indian Affairs Department here is doing now is really to focus on that community input to figure out um, many, many of those challenges. Additionally to those broadband challenges, you also have stigma, uh, stigma within tribal communities, but in just general about mental health and behavioral health and trying to just destigmatize the whole notion that you can ask for help. And Alicia, with the Youth Council, one of the recommendations to the state was the need to address mental health among young people across New Mexico. Talk a little bit about why the Youth Council sees this as a big need. Yes, so in the conversations we've had um, with our tribal youth in New Mexico, we certainly saw the priority uh, to you know, increase mental health wellness. We've seen you know, with the closure of, you know, things across the state and as well as within our own communities, the, you know, I believe like the, um, you know, the absence of ceremony has also been a damper within our communities. And, you know, although we still maintain our spiritual connection, that was one of the, the main ways to practice. And so we discussed, you know, how, the pandemic has taken a toll on, on youth, uh, primarily, you know, especially with, um, as Eldred mentioned, the move to um, telecommunications, whether, uh, especially in the terms of education. And so seeing how our um, youth have been moved online and, you know, a lot of the experiences that they've, um, they've had or expressed was that, um, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities when staying at home you know, taking care of um, older family members or even younger siblings and other relatives. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we provided that uh, space for support for them and to ensure that they are, um, you know, feeling like they have resources to look to. Um, and, you know, although this year has been very challenging for our communities, uh, we feel that it's important to recognize that spirit of resiliency and community uh, for our young people. And so that's why uh, we banded together as the Indigenous Youth Council with uh, the New Mexico State Indian Affairs Department to help create uh, spaces for that. And Teresa, it was mentioned earlier a little bit about um, the stigma surrounding talking about these issues. Um, even they're just tough topics to talk about or if it's any kind of taboo and how mistrust of maybe even getting professional help expand on how culturally sensitive topics like this are addressed through honoring Native life. Well, and, and thank, you for, uh, thank you for the question. And, and honoring Native life was um, born out of a um, state uh, legislatively created uh, Clearinghouse for Native American Suicide Prevention, and that was enacted in 2011. And it was really an effort um, from the Indian Affairs Department um, and um, the Behavioral Health Collaborative that came together to address uh, suicide clusters in, a couple, in several uh, tribal communities. And um, it really was created with the intent to provide um, culturally relevant, culturally appropriate um, suicide prevention um, efforts. Soon after the um, legislation was enacted, we the the um, founding group came together and we we talked about the name suicide prevention clearinghouse, and that's what, how honoring Native life um, was born out of that. Rather than focusing on the suicide, that we would focus on um, some positive aspects 
and at the same time in, ensure that we were engaging in suicide prevention um, strategies. And so how can people approach talking about mental health, um, well-being, and being culturally sensitive, either, if it's for them, you know, for them personally or for maybe friends or family members? Yes, the, um, we, I think society in general needs to talk about mental health in a different way. When we think about physical health, we think about, um, you know, someone diagnosed with cancer or maybe somebody has a broken leg. Um, we tend to, to lean in to um, attending to those um, individuals' needs. But when we are talking about mental health and mental health and, and uh, mental illness is just like a physical illness. It's a, it's a brain disorder in some cases. It's um, a, a number of things, but we don't talk about physical health and mental health in the same, in the same way. We also know that by not talking about it, um, I know in a, in a lot of tribal communities, um, there, the issue is um, taboo, but even if we don't talk about it, it's still occurring. We, we still see high rates of anxiety, depression, um, and we know that for American Indians across the country, that suicide um, is, is, a, is a exa it's exa exacerbating. And so um, we, we need to be talking about this and we need to remember that mental health is health and it's not separate. It's not separate from our, our whole being. And Eldred, Alicia talked a little bit about youth and how the pandemic is impacting youth. Um, you know, elders are also a really key part of tribal communities across the state. How are tribes and how is this uh, Indian Affairs Department helping ensure that elders are also being taken care of? Yeah, thank you for that question. So with the Indian Affairs Department at the moment, we're actually leading uh, one week out of the state's mental, mental health awareness month. And so every week there's a theme and this week is elders and tribal communities. So not just elders and tribal communities, but elders across our state uh, to honor their resilience as well as their leadership. And so in the Mexico Indian Affairs Department, uh, we understand and know that you know, mental health, behavioral health, it's holistic, but also intergenerational. And so the work that we do with our youth, it'll really connect and be, hopefully be that catalyst to um, tackle community wellness or in sense of better, ameliorate the community wellness in our tribal communities. So with that, um, we also partner with our state agency, um, Aging and Long-Term Services de Department to be able to provide those resources continually uh, to our eldest and most uh, respected members of our communities. And what kind of resources is the Indian Affairs Department looking for for mental health and behavioral health issues um, from the state of New Mexico? Yeah, great question. So for the Indian Affairs Department, we're really rooted in community input. Um, we're learning more and more how pivotal our position is as a department within uh, the state's overall um, behavioral health ecosystem. And so one of the arms that we do have within the department is to work with the Native American subcommittee, uh, which you know, brings together all different types, all communities within New Mexico, uh, all tribal nations. And those resources that we do provide, and not only to provide them community, but also to get that feedback into what they're moving forward. Some of the ideas that we have on the forefront, in addition to this Youth Wellness Summit, uh, are to look at uh, broadband capabilities, how to better that, how to bolster our behavioral health providers within our tribal communities, uh, other resources in terms of uh, health care lines or mental health uh, helplines, such as warm lines or hotlines. In addition to that as well, just getting out materials. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we partnered with uh, the Human Services Department and within their Behavioral Health Services Division with artist Ricardo Cate from Kiwa Pueblo, and we were able to put out a youth um, mental health COVID-19 coloring book. And so from there, it was really to um, help the youth be able to connect with their family members all the way from parents to grandparents and talk about um, some of these difficulties that we're facing at this time. And Alicia, the youth, there's a tribal youth wellness summit in June. Indigenous knowledge is going to be focused on for healing and responding to COVID-19. And talk a little bit about why indigenous knowledge is such a key important part of tribal communities. 
Yes. So in terms of, you know, Indigenous knowledge being integral to the focus of this Youth Wellness Summit, uh, we feel that, you know, health, um, as Teresa has explained, is, um, you know, multi-level. It encompasses physical, um, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. And so um, within that, it's, you know, com it contains all of these. And so we want to make sure that we're following what we know to be true in our communities of, you know, being holistic. And, uh, you know, within that, it's uh, collaborating with so many different resources amongst the state, especially utilizing Honoring Native Life's platform and their knowledge um, to help contribute to that. And also, you know, maintaining that cultural uh, respect um, for all of our communities. And Teresa, where can people go or how can they find information? Um, what do they do if they think they're in need of some resources? There's, there's quite a few um, access, uh, crisis and access lines um, that, that are available, uh, text lines, crisis text lines. And I just heard of a new initiative coming out of uh, Northwest Portland area um, Indian Health Board, where um, individuals can try uh, text 741-741, and within that text, write the word native, and um, then can be connected with someone um, who's familiar with uh, tribal nations and responding to those crises. But there's uh, quite a few uh, text lines and uh, phone lines that people can call um, to get help, especially if they're in crisis or if they just need someone to talk to. Well, thank you all so much for joining us here today on New Mexico PBS, Eldred, Alicia, and Teresa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Things appear to be going from bad to worse for the state's Workforce Solutions Department. The former secretary, Bill McCamley, stepped down suddenly in April and now says it was in part because of harassment he faced personally from folks frustrated with the processing of their unemployment claims in the midst of a global pandemic. And the Legislative Finance Committee issued a report that found the state may have overpaid on unemployment claims to the tune of $250 million. Nearly half of that, according to the LFC, might in fact be fraudulent. Now, Senator Snyder, the governor has said in a statement that those numbers are actually much lower, but either way, this has turned into a financial mess for the state, no doubt. Given the unprecedented nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, is it any surprise that there would be problems? Let's just sort of start there. Were you shocked when you first heard the story? Well, that t level of money always is shocking to yeah. me. But but that there were problems? No, it, it, it is, isn't. And I certainly don't think it's unique to New Mexico. I haven't done any study or research on other states. Mm -hmm. But when you have that kind of, and I believe it was rapid change in the number of applicants. Mm -hmm. First of all, you're short staffed. You, you have to find staff to hire to handle things. You, what, I believe it was going from 14,000 phone calls up to 200,000 phone calls. Well, the, the, number, the number went from 7,500 a month to 75,000 a day. 75,000 yes, calls I, a you. day, that's amazing. Who could handle and, that? And the, Mm -hmm. Nobody can. And certainly nobody ever dreamed that we would have to. Mm -hmm. So and we're also facing the fact that we were loaned money to cover right. some of our right. uh, initial expenses. Mm -hmm. So that's in addition to the 200,000. And I don't know whose figures are right, the studies or, or the governors. The problem, the thing is, we still have a problem and we still have unemployed people mm -hmm. uh, that we have to honor our commitment to them for unemployment. So I'm not surprised that we have a problem. I'm just waiting to see really and truly how severe a problem it is mm -hmm. because the money has to be found someplace. That's a good point there. And I wanna ask Serge, you just made an interesting point on the, on the level of money in that loan. Uh, the LFC has a concern of a $278 million loan from the federal government to shore up the state's unemployment insurance Fund and the state has received 1.75 billion in American Rescue Act funds, and it appears that at least some of that money will go back to paying that loan I just mentioned. But the big question is, how do we get this back under control 
from here, Tom Garrity, given we have an interim secretary in Ricky Cerna, who's been around, he's doing the best he can, but holy smokes, he's got an uphill climb here. Yeah, most definitely. You know, the, the there there was a lot of uh, fraud, which you know I think is the the main culprit mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the major overpayments. I mean, there was also fraud with the PPP program. Right. Uh, so you know the, the the surprise. You know, we shouldn't be shocked, but maybe we should be surprised uh, with just how massive this issue is. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had a, a personal connection uh, with the with the fraud issue because back in October of last year. Uh, my identity was uh, was stolen, mm. and it was used to actually leverage unemployment benefits oh, wow. uh, for someone. Um, and so, you know, I had a chance to work it work that both from the employer side as well as the employee side, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that you know the the state of Mexico is just simply overloaded, and you know the level of anxiety that it provides to you know anyone, and knowing that I'm not alone now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is really something else. So, you know, uh, it it's, has since been resolved, but wow, it took about six to seven months to get it all kind of, you know, uh, put into place. So hopefully uh, New Mexicans will get answers, uh, you know, to not just, you know, what's next for employers as far as, you know, are, are our contributions to this fund going to continue to increase wow. uh, to make up for that shortfall or, you know, will we be provided grace? Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, there's still a lot of questions around this, not the least of which is, is how did the fraud occur? That's a good point there. And six to seven months, I thought you were going to say six to seven days when you started to get into that sentence. That, oh, man. Hey, Serge, you know, the governor has been pretty quiet on this issue. You know, she's issued some statements, but so far, She's not really done an in-depth interview that I've seen on this situation. Does she need to get in front of the public to answer some of these questions? I mean, we're talking a classic buck stops here kind of moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think not only is it a good opportunity to sort of say, yeah, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. I honestly think this, I mean, this LFC report to me seems is a bit of a hit job. I think DWS did this exactly right. We're talking about billions of dollars coming through mm -hmm you know, a, a non zero amount of fraud. But if you do the math, if I've done it correctly, it's, you know, in the neighborhood of three or 4% of this money in a pandemic with a huge amount of, you know, new claims coming in when the primary thing we're worried about is making sure that New Mexicans are taken care of, mm -hmm. that we are you know, doing the math or the calculus, right. Of saying, are we going to make it the barriers to getting this and making sure we're accurate so insurmountable that we underserve the people of New Mexico? Or are we going to say, let's get this money out? And is there an acceptable, you know, I don't know what the right number is, but to me, is 3% slippage, right? An acceptable level um, of misallocation and misappropriation when we're talking about the tens of thousands of New Mexicans who are receiving this and helping this? I vote yes every single day. Mm -hmm. To me, this is a no brainer. I don't understand, you know, this is. Sure, let's look at it. Let's try to figure out. But we have seen here and all over the place, right? In housing, one of my favorite things to talk about, one of the biggest problems with getting rent to people right. has been the documentation, the getting of all the right pieces of paper to everybody. And less money is going out the door. I think DWS made the right call on this. And I support that. I think this was, this is a, a, a moment to say, yes, yes, this happened. And you know, this is why, and we prioritize New Mexicans over, you know, trying to, you know. I, I, make I think I know what you're trying to say there. A absolutely. I, I, I hear your point loud and clear. But Senator, in the meantime, um, we've got an 8.2% unemployment rate here in New Mexico. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's obviously work to be done in, we don't know who, what percentage is looking for a job. And by the way, that puts us tied with New York for the third highest unemployment rate in the country, just for perspective there. Is that news just going to exacerbate the problems we're having with fraudulent claims that we're talking about right now? I don't think the, the fact that New York and New Mexico are tied mm -hmm. is going to exacerbate it. I think the fact that New Mexicans who are unemployed see these millions, even billions of dollars coming into our state mm -hmm. and they can't get a phone call answered they can't get an email answered they can't do they can't get mm -hmm. any response about their claim i think and i went in and i've looked at all these things there's some questions that you don't know whether they're asking this 
are they asking that? Mm -hmm. And I think that they will find, and, and maybe I'm being naive, I don't know, but I think they'll find that some of the fraud is because people simply didn't know which answer to choose, which they didn't fit in either box completely. Mm -hmm. So I think you will find some of that. But I think the main th thing is, and we've not really talked about this, is that some people uh, are in New Mexico are actually earning more through the unemployment than they were um, as an employee. Well, I tried to think of who, what categories that would be. And I only, and here again, it could be wrong, mm -hmm. but uh, I can only think of like the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. And and when you have, as most people know, there's a lower wage pay for mm -hmm. wait staff, for instance, right. and they depend on their tips. Well, is, is their evaluation by the Department of Labor do they look at what they were actually paid hourly, that right. lower rate? That's right. Or do they count in any, and if you start looking at, and if you're having to read, a lot of people right now have finished out their first round. Let me, let me, of, let me, of, let me do this, uh, Senator. I, I appreciate that, your, your point there. I want to ask Tom to kind of wrap it up here, but under a minute okay. here. Dovetailing off what Senator is describing here, Tom, I'm, I'm curious about perception and, and how this all works for the general citizenry and our trust in government our trust in how we do our business. What's, what's the perception bounce here from this story? Yeah, well, for Department of Workforce Solutions, unfortunately, they're reinforcing a negative. Uh, you know, uh, trust in state and federal government has been on the decline for the last eight years. Right. And, uh, you know, so these types of uh, missteps by government will not do anything to rebuild it very quickly unless uh, they increase really the frontline personnel and the communications uh, you know, that's the big question mark right now is, you know, people try and call the the mm -hmm. 800 number or the toll free number of the call center. And they just say that uh, they get a message saying that, you know what, um, all lines are busy. Right. Uh, you know, I, I know this because I've called it. And so you, what you want to be able to do is, you know, make sure that everybody has a chance to, you know, get on that call waiting list. Uh, to be placed on hold, even if it's a really long time. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of customer service items that government can do and implement uh, to really rebuild or at least to you know, kind of balance out that trust so they can start to build it back up again. Well, interesting point there. And that's going to have to come with a new head of the department. They haven't had a PIO for over a year. Like the whole thing, this could be an opportunity just revamp the whole deal. Thanks to the entire panel for taking the time to research and discuss this important topic. We're back in a bit with more debate, this time around taxpayers potentially footing the bill for cleaning up after the oil and gas industry. Since the 1990s, the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program has brought tens of thousands of New Mexico students to the Rio Grande each year. Once they're in the outdoor classroom, they collect data on everything from how cottonwood forests are doing to how deep or shallow groundwater levels are. All that data isn't just a science lesson, it's used by federal scientists and other researchers to better understand the Rio Grande and how it's changing. That program's funding is now in jeopardy. Correspondent Laura Paskus talks with BEMP's Executive Director, Greg Dyson. Greg Dyson, welcome to New Mexico in Focus. The Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, it's a 20-year-old program. Students collect data from the Rio Grande, everything from groundwater levels to leaf litter. Can you briefly tell us a little bit who are these students and who are the scientists who rely upon this data? Yeah, hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. Um, the students um, are from all over the state, actually. I mean, the, the majority are from Bernalillo County. Uh, we do a lot with Albuquerque Public Schools, and we're based at Bosque School, the, the private school uh, right along the Rio Grande. And um, we take kindergartners through 12th graders out to the Bosque, and they collect the scientific data, which ranges from uh, the depth of groundwater to litter fall, to um, the precipitation amounts, um, and um, all types of agencies and government bodies use the data. It ranges from uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Bureau, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Bernalillo County, City of Albuquerque, Valencia, uh, Soil and Water Conservation District, the, you know, Rio Grande, uh, 
MRGCD, uh, Middle Rio Grande Conservation District. Um, so, and, and that's just a partial list, um, but all types of folks use our data for the management of the Middle Rio Grande. And it looks like you have funding from a variety of different sources, but the bulk of your funding comes from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it sounds like that's changing. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening and, and why that's happening? Yeah, yeah, we've had a long-standing relationship with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They've funded them pretty um, generous, generously over the years, and it's through the um, uh, there's lots of acronyms uh, in this business. Um, it's the MRGESCP, -E the Middle Rio Grande Endangered Species um, Collaborative Program. <laughs> and uh, the what's happened is that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers funding for this program has been cut dramatically because their budget has been cut dramatically. So they're making cuts all over the place. And this, um, this collaborative program is really feeling it. And we got our funding through that, and through the US Army Corps of Engineers is about two thirds of our budget. And we're in the last year of that. So um, the last, with the next federal fiscal year, October 1st, we will, we're looking at a two thirds cut in our budget. So what kinds of impacts will that have on students, on the monitoring, on the data that you're able to collect? Well, we are, we are um, we have lots of feelers out for getting funding back from from other agencies and, and government bodies, um, and are very hopeful that we can make up at least a big part of that. And but we're also doing a worst case scenario planning right now. We have 33 active sites along the Middle Rio Grande, and we would go down to 10 uh, in a worst case scenario. And instead of reaching you know 10,000 students a year, would be more like a at one one thousand or two of two thousand at the most so it's pretty pretty major cut we're currently not replacing staff to leave um, so we're we're kind of gearing up for a worst case scenario but also very helpful for the best so this is a critical time the last year not just for students who are um, and teachers who are having to deal with the pandemic and all the changes that has wrought across our educational systems but also the rio grande um, you know climate change drought changes to the river and the bosque um, what does this loss mean for 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 lots of different people yeah i mean it's the the saddest um the saddest impact is with the students who, you know, we're really looking forward to getting back in the field with them uh, come, come the fall semester. And we would have to cut back dramatically. And the data is, it's, it's sad to lose a year of data for those sites we'd have to drop. Well, we wouldn't drop them, we'd, we'd set them aside until our funding came back up. Um, we wouldn't close them permanently. Um, but I think the real impact is with the students who, I mean, it's, it's getting out in the field and learning to be a young scientist is a unique opportunity. And um, we don't merely do field trips, we take students out and we show them how to collect uh, scientifically sound data. And the number of examples of students who, who go on to say, you know, the biology, the UNM biology uh, program uh, I mean, it's it's really just exciting to see students kind of think, wow, I, I can be a scientist. Yeah, we did a show in 2017 where we went out with um, students and, and BEMP uh, staffers, and we had a really great time and really saw that firsthand of the students' excitement. But also I've heard from many scientists and researchers over the years how they use this data. And certainly as the Rio Grande is changing, to have this data set really seems um, really seems pretty critical. So what will happen if we miss out on monitoring sites, if there's time gaps in some of this monitoring? How does that affect people? Well, I mean, you can, one of the, one of the data sets that, that I enjoy talking about is, our de is depth to groundwater. So everyone's familiar with the cottonwoods along the Bosque. Cottonwoods generally uh, will only the roots will go down about three meters uh, in order to to find water, and um, having that losing a year of data on what's happening with the with the groundwater level is really important for us to be able to know what's happening with the cottonwoods in the bosque. 
And, um, you know, that's, these are long-term data sets. So we're, the sky is not falling if we have to set some data sets aside for a year um, yet. Uh, the continuity, we're, we're actually approaching closer to 25 years of, of data with a lot of these data sets. And the, the continuity is one of the things that makes these data sets so special. Yeah, this seems like some bad timing all around, given the challenges that we yeah. face on the Rio Grande. Is there anything that people can do at this point? Well, I think um, we the, one of the great things about this whole situation is that reaching out to our partners, we've informed all our partners of our funding situation, and everyone has been so supportive. And um, we just need that support to turn into actual funding. Uh, of course, and, and anyone can donate to BEMP anytime. I think it's also great to let your elected officials know how much BEMP means to the community. And, um, that that has the biggest impact, I think, of anything. All right. Well, Greg Dyson, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. We've talked a lot this week about the taxpayers' burden in New Mexico, whether it be Spaceport America or the overpayment of unemployment benefits. And our last topic also follows that theme, this time when it comes to cleaning up abandoned oil and gas infrastructure, should a company go belly up. A new study commissioned by the state land office finds taxpayers could be on the hook for more than $8 billion. It's a complicated issue, but basically comes down to steps companies have to go through to set aside money for cleanup should they go bankrupt. That's part of getting a drilling permit, but in the wake of this new report, Land Commissioner Stephanie Garcia Richards says those assurances only really cover the plugging of wells and not all the other remediation that goes into shutting down abandoned well sites. And Serge, are you surprised we're just realizing this as a state? I mean, that's a $8 billion. That's a pretty good surprise. Uh, it is, I mean, a bit surprising to think that folks, if folks didn't actually see, think about, you know, what the actual costs are going to be and the potential for, for damage. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know, it's not clear to me how recently this issue has been revisited, and and you know the bond prices many of these were set decades and decades mm -hmm. ago. They don't even keep up with inflation, let alone the cost of plugging new wells, and didn't take into account you know any other additional remediation. So I mean this is a has been a slow moving uh, development, but one that you know. Probably, I don't know, again, how recently this was looked at, mm -hmm. but it seems like it was fairly predictable to that this would be, these costs would be included in yeah. the cleanup. You know, Senator, you know, according to the study, the financial assurances provided by the companies currently in operation will only cover two, about $200 million of the total remediation costs. That's a big gap from $8 billion. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we got to do something here. What does your political instincts tell you how we we fix this? Uh, well, first of all, be very political. I have to uh, always, when you're evaluating uh, whether you believe a report or not, one mm -hmm. of the things you look at is who paid for it. Ah. And the fact that it was paid for by the land commissioner who has consistently, even back through her uh, campaign, not been a great friend of the oil and gas industry. So it makes me a little suspect. That's my political viewpoint. What we're going to do about it is is another thing. I I guess there's a part of me that says, why do we suddenly think we're going to have all these bankrupt companies? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, COVID has impacted it some, or, but the biggest thing is is I think the fact that everyone is pretending that we're going to get to. Um, uh, uh, solar and wind energy at the level of ah. which uh, revenues produced by oil and gas in say the next 10 or 15 years yeah. when when people are making commitments to be all solar by that time. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the unrealistic part. So if we really, if that was po physically possible to do, then yes, we would be have companies go bankrupt. A lot of companies over the next 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. But I don't see us going away from oil and gas that quickly. I think that it takes longer to, to produce the jobs and the energy mm -hmm. because we don't have the lines as we've all 
uh, been aware of to transmit the energy itself, That's the power point, lines. Yeah. We don't yeah. have the grid. That's right. So I think there are a lot of things that go into this that nobody talked about. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see that many companies going bankrupt in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think 8 billion is an awfully big number. Good point there. Um, Tom, part of the issue is the state bonding requirements. They're tiny relative to all these costs we're talking about here. We talk a lot about what oil and gas brings to the state. Senator just mentioned this, but it's not going to last forever. And these costs are notoriously hard to recoup. I mean, bonding was last updated decades ago, as Senator just mentioned as well. Are lawmakers too eager to listen to industry lobbyists in your view? What, like what's going on here? Well, uh, boy, you know, that's a whole other topic right there. I, <laughs> you know, here, here's where I, you know, there's, there is a need, and I think that there's a little bit of uh, political play and mm -hmm. such. You know, uh, according to different media reports, there have been about 277 wells that have been capped. And that's what the, uh, the bonds are being set aside for, is right. for the cleanup of those particular capped wells. Um, with, the, uh, with the narrative really focusing on uh, fossil fuels not being, uh, you know, really a transition from there. And we've seen a couple of things recently in a, a court in Denmark. Uh, as well as uh, a, a Fortune 500 oil and gas company having an environmentalist now as a part of their board, you know that there is going to be a shift, uh, you know, uh, in in that in that general area, which could result in additional wells being capped. And so I think that on one hand, uh, the land commissioner is 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 smart to get ahead of that and to say, okay, what are the potential costs? Is the state of New Mexico covered? On the other, you know, I think that uh, you know there. Uh, since we haven't really heard from industry and in any of the media coverage that I saw, mm -hmm. that the, the industry is probably scratching their heads going, OK, wait a second. You know, is this really an accurate assessment of the current state of affairs? Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that this is a conversation that will have to continue uh, and have a lot more input from the industry. But I think it's a it's a good start to, uh, to the conversation. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one particular remedy, as the as the commissioner has identified, is to increase um, you know, the bonding rates, uh, which uh, which are pretty significant, you know, from 25,000 per right. well to 150,000 a well. That's right. It's a lot of cash. That's right. Her quote is, we need to right size our bonding requirements, our assurance requirements on any development that happens on state land. And that's that seems pretty clear. You know, Serge, how does the governor's push towards renewable energy sources affect this discovery? It, it's I want to follow up, obviously, where Senator was at a little bit ago, but is, there, is this impactful, you know, where the governor wants to go? She's been very clear on this in this financial situation. Uh, I mean, I think so. I think mm -hmm. that you see what's going on around the world, right? This is, you know, an industry dependent on the price of a commodity that they have no control over. Mm -hmm. And although it's not quite as fragile as it looked maybe a year ago, it's, you know, there's still lots of potential for for the uh, cost of developing and you know operating these wells to be more than the the economic value of doing so mm -hmm. relatively soon relatively quickly relatively easily even the absence in the absence of this push towards renewables but with that in mind yeah i think it's absolutely a factor and i think i agree with uh, senator Schneider that mm -hmm. this is not you know a crisis that we need to rush out to and fix in this right at this moment it's not all falling apart but there's a lot of potential for that and it's something that we need to to keep in mind and yeah it's accelerating because of this push i i mean i imagine it is going to accelerate based yeah. on this the push towards renewables which is yeah. a good thing senator real quick we're, we're just so pinched on time but i want to get this in there was a house memorial this past session of the i'm sorry my fault the 2020 session they called for a review of all energy bonds, but it never made it anywhere. Did lawmakers sort of miss the moment there? I, I think at the time, memorials, as you know, have no effect in law. Mm -hmm. they, they mean nothing other than the fact that usually if you pass one, they'll do a little study of something. And it could mm -hmm. have simply been a time crunch. I don't know the exact reason, or, but I don't see it being, uh, all it called for was a study. And I just don't see that, that that there was any great political opposition to killing it or any uh, right. memorial. Right. You know, uh, Tom, just real quick on that last thought there, you know, memorial is a memorial, as, as Senator mentioned. Is it just not, are we going to get serious here and take that step past memorials into something a little more concrete? 
Well, you know, all of that, all roads lead to the budget. And so until the legislators and the governor really come together to say, how are we going to replace uh, the potential lost revenue from the oil and gas industry? Um, you know, until those serious conversations have been held, uh, then all I think we're, we're going to see are memorials that uh, get tabled. There you go. There will be public meetings coming up to discuss this issue, and we'll do our best to share that information with you when we have it. I want to thank all of our line panelists for joining us this week. I'm back in just a second with some final thoughts for the week. We covered a lot of ground tonight. Three complicated issues that need context and a nuanced discussion to make sense of it all. I would like to note particularly my colleague Antonia Gonzalez in her noting the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department in their work on suicide prevention for tribal members. As mentioned earlier in the show, May is Mental Health Awareness Month and it's really encouraging to see a special focus on the unique mental health strategies needed in a diverse population. One size of mental health help and advice does not fit all. We all have unique mental health burdens to carry and recognizing the context and nuance needed to meet that burden is exactly where to start. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.